Welcome, ladies, this morning. I am so happy that each one of you are here. Hopefully you had a great time in your groups this morning. With a little extra time for fellowship and some good food. It was smelling good in all the hallways this morning. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Our children are having a great day today. This is one of my favorite of all time children's lessons. Those kiddos are talking about John the Baptist today. So they're talking about the camel hair clothes he wore. They have things that you can feel back there that feel like that. They're talking about the bugs he ate. There are actually live crickets back there as illustration in one of the classrooms. I didn't know that, but you can buy crickets at PetSmart, 19 cents a piece, just in case you're interested. But they will be talking about all things John the Baptist this morning, so be sure and ask your kiddos about that this afternoon. Um, creativity abounds with our children's teachers, and we are so thankful for them. And we're thankful for y'all for allowing your children to be with us. And speaking of children, I know you all want an update. Leslie made it to Tampa in time to see the birth of her grandbaby at 4 p.m. on Thursday of last week, and she would like to introduce him to you herself. So let's go to that video. Hello, CBS class. Uh, thank y'all for being patient in my absence, but um, this little bit came a couple weeks early and he is doing great. Oh, now he just closed his eyes. There he is, there he is. This is Samuel Wesley Dawson, born January 24th at four in the afternoon, and he has stolen my heart, but I will be back. <laughs> I will be back next week, but my heart will be in Florida, but I am excited to get back to y'all. Um, but say hi, Sam. He's saying hi. <laughs> Love y'all. See y'all next week. Bye. Isn't that just precious? I was talking to her on the phone yesterday after she sent me that, and I was talking about how cute it was, and she said, yeah, well, I asked Taylor to film that, and then afterwards I thought, well, maybe I should have had Taylor in it. And I thought, well, that's just like a new grandma. I mean, you go there, you take a glamorous picture with the baby, forget about the mom. I mean, she only carried him for nine months and went labor 14 hours. But, you know, Taylor, who's that? It's all about Samuel now. No, I'm joking. Y'all know Leslie better than that. She is there in the trenches with Taylor, walking alongside her as she embarks on this new journey of motherhood. And from what Leslie says, she's just so proud of Taylor because she is handling it all very confidently and calmly, and so it's a real blessing for Leslie to be able to be there. So we are excited that she's there, but very excited that she will be coming back. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we dive into our scriptures. God, I just thank you for this lesson and for what you have taught me over this week and for the time that you have carved out for me to work on it. Lord, get me out of the way this morning and speak through me to these ladies that each one of them may hear exactly what you have for them this morning in this lesson. We thank you for your son, Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so this morning we're continuing to study Paul's second missionary journey. And after the powerful experience in the jail last week at Philippi, Paul is ready to move on, and Luke apparently stays in Philippi to encourage the believers there. So it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy that continue to Thessalonica. This was a cosmopolitan city with a Jewish presence. So there was a synagogue there, so that's where Paul begins his ministry. There he would found the find the devout Jews as well as the uh, Gentile God seekers, or they were called proselytes. These were people like Lydia that we met last week who were worshipers of God, but didn't know Jesus yet. So Paul's there for three weeks, and we begin to see a pattern in the way he does his witnessing. He finds common ground with his audience, and then he leads them to uncommon faith to a faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. He takes them from the familiar to the unfamiliar, from what they know to what is unknown. The common ground in this um, first setting in Thessalonica is Old Testament scriptures. We're told that Paul is reasoning with the people in the synagogues. He's discussing the scriptures, he explains when necessary, and he gives evidence of the risen Christ. 
And we don't have a lot of details about the results, but we do know that some Jews are won over and a larger number of Gentiles. But there's a group of Jews who aren't happy with Paul's progress. They're threatened by the power of this new movement with Jesus at the head of it. So spurned by jealousy, they find some thugs, they stir up a mob, and they get the whole city in an uproar. And the mob goes searching for Paul and his friends, and they come upon a, a, the house of a guy named Jason. And if y'all came this morning wanting to know more about Jason, I'm sorry, I don't have more to tell you because there really isn't much to know. All the commentaries I read, there's not a lot of info on this guy named Jason, except that he was a believer, and he was obviously a very bold believer because he let Paul and friends stay in his home. And he also took a big risk because when Jason um, was dragged in front of the authorities, what he ended up doing was posting bond. He either uh, put up money or possessions to guarantee that Paul would leave the city and never return. So there's a lesson in the story of Jason. He's an unsung hero. He's probably one of many people who aren't even named that Paul encountered on his missionary trips who impacted um, the world for Christ. So whatever you're doing for God's kingdom, you may not re be receiving much attention or you may getting, be getting negative attention like Jason did, but rest assured that God delights in using you and that your faithful service and your courage will impact the lives of other believers. So Paul and his crew head west, down the road about 50 miles to Berea, where Paul again starts with common ground, talking about Old Testament scriptures in the synagogue. But Luke describes these people in Berea as noble-minded because they didn't just accept what he said, they put it to the test against scriptures to make sure that it was true. What a beautiful example for all of us. I've seen uh, churches and even Sunday school classes that are named after the Bereans, and now I understand why, because they set the example as early believers in showing us what we need to do to be ensuring that what we're taught is true and comes straight from the scriptures. So it's beginning to look like Paul's gonna get a break. I mean, people are listening and they're actually actively engaged in discerning the truth. But then that ugly mob from down the road travels 50 miles to find him in Berea, and they stir up trouble there and cause that city to get into an uproar as well. Jealousy, we see, is a powerful motivator. It's interesting to look at the accusations that are made against Paul and his friends. They're faulted for, for going against Caesar and for proclaiming another king. And it's true, they are proclaiming Jesus as king, but not the earthly king like the Jews are implying here, not a king to rival Caesar. The Jews are also accusing Paul and his crew of having turned the world upside down. But what they're referencing there is the turmoil that follows Paul wherever he goes. And in this instance, there would not have been any turmoil or any ruckus whatsoever if the Jews hadn't started the riot because Paul was just peacefully preaching and teaching. But spiritually, this accusation holds a whole lot of weight because ladies, the gospel message, when it's received, it does turn the world upside down. Or perhaps more aptly put, sin has turned the world upside down and only the gospel message of faith in Jesus Christ can turn it right again. So after the second riot, Paul is escorted to a ship for security reasons, and he's put out to sea. Silas and Timothy remain in Berea, and this is how Paul finds himself in Athens alone. And so this really wasn't part of Paul's plan. He sends the guys who brought him there back to get uh, Timothy and Silas, so he obviously wants them to join him in his ministry. But while waiting, his spirit is really stirred by all that's going around him in Athens. There's idols everywhere. And from what I read, Paul probably hadn't planned to begin to evangelize until the rest of his team got there, but seeing the depravity in the city, he just, he just couldn't hold it in. For this reason, I think, 
he abandons the strategy of going solely to the synagogue at first, and instead he splits his time every day. He goes to the synagogue for part of the day, and then he goes to the marketplace for the other part of the day where he talks to absolutely anybody who will listen to him. So I'm going to pause here for just a little bit of historical context on the city of Athens. Athens was in a period of decline during the time that Paul was there. The glory of its politics and commerce had long since faded, but it was still recognized as a center for culture and for education. The city was given over to cultured paganism, characterized by novelty and philosophy and idolatry. It was often said that it would be easier to find little g gods in Athens than it would be to find men. And I'm going to tell a quick story just to illustrate the depth of the idolatry there. And this story is not biblical, um, but I ran across it in a couple of commentaries that I read, and it's supposedly supported by historical documents. But in the 6th century before Christ, Athens was being um, afflicted by this mysterious and horrific plague, and they couldn't figure out why they were being plagued, and they couldn't eradicate it. And so, of course, they went and thought that it was one of their gods that had been offended. But since they had hundreds of gods, they could never really figure out. They had authorities working on it. They could never figure out which god was offended, and the plague went on and on. And so eventually, they invited a guy from Crete, from the island of Crete. He was somewhat of a consultant. And he came in, and he tells them, oh, no, it's not that you've offended one of your existing gods. You've perhaps offended a god that is yet unknown to you. And so he says that he's got a way that he can fix things. So this guy, he has a herd of sheep, and he releases those sheep in a succulent pasture. Well, first, he doesn't release the sheep until he's held them without food for a couple of days. So supposedly the sheep are really hungry. And then he releases them into this field, this succulent pasture, and the thinking was that any of the sheep that don't eat to their fill, it would be inexplicable. And so the sheep are released, and to the amazement of everybody watching, there are a few sheep who don't eat. They just lay down. And so wherever that happens, he tells them to erect an altar to the unknown God, and then they sacrifice the sheep that laid down there on that altar. So that is what they did, and as the story goes, supposedly shortly after that, the plague subsided. So this is the kind of culture that Paul is walking into, and he starts to preach in the marketplace, and he encounters a very intellectual crowd. These are people who spend their days talking about um, life and philosophy, philosophizing about life. Now, I have to admit, I've never understood philosophy. I don't know, I don't think I even took it in college. If I did, I certainly don't remember anything about it. I would go with the, um, the definition of philosophy that was written in a newspaper column one time, and that, what, that says, unintelligible answers to insoluble problems. That's, that's how I would go with it. But I think the people in Athens would have been sorely offended at that definition. And they would have been, they would have held firmly to Aristotle's definition of philosophy, which is the science which considers truth. So the Athenians, they saw themselves as people who were always seeking the truth. But were they really? How would they respond to the truth in Paul's message? There was two camps of philosophers that were mentioned, the Stoics and the Epicureans. And y'all should have discussed those in your core group this morning, so I'm not going to go into detail about them. But let's just say that if they had to have a slogan or a motto, a bumper sticker for their chariots back in those days, or in contemporary times, a hashtag, the Epicureans would be hashtag enjoy life, and the Stoics would be hashtag endure life. But Paul, he was there to tell them how to enter into abundant life through faith in the Son of the risen God, Jesus Christ. So Paul's daily debates in the marketplace sparked a lot of attention. 
The interest around his message was mainly out of fascination, just fascination with something new, a novel message. Paul didn't care what the motive was. They invited him to explain what he was teaching, and he was grateful for the invitation. And for the sake of the gospel, he was not going to waste this opportunity. He's taken to the Areopagus, and that word represents a physical place, which is a um, very rocky ridge on the um, rocky ridge that's also known as Mars Hill. But it's also the name of the council in Athens, the council that would have been overseeing religion and education in the city. So here it is that Paul was given the opportunity to explain what he'd been teaching. And the talk that he gives is now considered a masterpiece of communication. And it's been studied for centuries by both Christians and non-Christians alike. So before we look at what Paul said, let's look at the why behind the way Paul presented it. Remember the theme that was established before of Paul finding common ground and then leading them to uncommon faith in Jesus Christ, taking them from the familiar to the unfamiliar. But with this crowd, what would that common ground be? Referring to the God of the Old Testament who chose a certain people and sent prophets and promised a Messiah, that wasn't going to work with this crowd. Leave it to Paul to find a creative way to meet the Athenians right where they were without compromising the gospel message in any way. He begins with a compliment to them. He says he recognizes that they're a really religious group. Now, I'm sure that he's just holding back the indignation that he feels towards all the idols that he's seen. But he he finds this one little opening, this positive thing, that they are at least interested in spiritual things. And for an object lesson, Paul chooses something straight out of their very own culture, the altar to the unknown God, which he had noticed as he's walking around. And I've already mentioned the altar. It, It wasn't an idol. Because an idol for a little g god would um, need some type of identification. It would need a name. It would need some attributes and characteristics if someone was going to make an image or an idol of it. But this altar had no idol because the identification and the attributes of this god were unknown. So I'm just amazed at the psychology behind all this and the wisdom of Paul. Without being offensive, Paul exposes the error of their thinking. He wants to introduce them to the one true God. So he shows them that they've basically already admitted the existence of this God. The very presence of that altar acknowledges the fact that all the other little g gods that are worshiped in Athens are not enough. The existence of that altar is testimony to the inadequacy of their own religion. So now that Paul's gotten their attention with something familiar, he begins to unpack something very unfamiliar. From common ground, he begins to introduce the uncommon God, the one true big G God. And his address includes four basic truths. First, He boldly affirms the greatness of God by stating that God made the world and everything in it and that he's Lord over all he has made. The unknown God whom they acknowledge exists, who caused all things to come into existence, including men. And his very creation bears testimony of his existence. The God who was to them unknown had actually made himself known. God's not trying to hide from men, but sometimes men are hiding from God to protect their power or their position or their lifestyle. If God is unknown to these Athenians, it's not because he hasn't revealed himself. It's because they have closed their eyes to his existence. Paul emphasizes here that God doesn't dwell in temples made with human hands, After all, how could the God of all creation be contained in something man-made? This was a direct affront to all the shrines and temples around Paul. Instead of worshiping the creator 
and giving him glory, the people of Athens were worshiping creation itself through their little g gods that were often assigned attributes of nature. So Paul then moves to his second point, stating that God is not served by human hands as though he needs anything. He wants the people to understand the goodness of God and the fact that God is the provider of all that we need. Not only did the temples in Athens not contain God, but the services and the rituals that were done there could never add anything to God. Now, I, I'm guilty of coming down hard on these unbelievers, but um, and granted, the things that they did in their temples, they often performed immoral acts as, as services in their temples. But even we as believers and as Christians, we can have the wrong view of our service to God. We can never take pride in our service to God, believing that we are providing anything that he can't supply. Because we can provide nothing to God that helps him accomplish his purposes. Although he delights in us when we serve him out of love and from a pure heart, he is self-sufficient and he does not need man. As the great provider, he provides to us everything we need, life and breath and all things. Next, Paul moves on to the ruling nature of God and his sovereignty. You see that the little g gods that the Greeks had, they were distant beings. They had their own emotions and rivalries and ambitions, and they weren't concerned about the needs of men. But the uncommon God that Paul wants them to know is the God of all history. From one man, Adam, he created every nation on the earth. And just as God is sovereignly active in the lives of us as individuals, he is also sovereign over the rise and fall, the physical power, the political power of nations is all under his control. Yet he is still a God that desires that we seek him and know him personally. And I, I love this last part of our text because Paul, he shows this group of high and mighty intellectuals that he's actually pretty darn smart himself. In verse 28, Paul quotes a poet that they all would have known with the line, in him we live and move and exist. And then he cites another poet who wrote, we also are his children. Now, both of those lines were written um, about their Greeks, their own little g gods. But God takes those um, thoughts from pagan poets and he shows them how they line up with the revelation of the one true God. The first quote supports what Paul has just said about us owing our very life and breath to God. And then the second quote supports Paul's um, point that God made all people and all nations from one man so that we are all his children by creation. It's a debate tactic of quoting your opponent's own material to support your point. And the fact that we are all God's children created in his image just exposes the foolishness of making gods in our own image out of gold or stone or whatever. The Greek religion was nothing but the manufacture and worship of gods that were patterned after men and that acted like men. How foolish to worship that which they made with their own hands rather than the God of all creation. Now Paul had not only shown the folly of temples and temple rituals, but he is showing them the folly of all idol idolatry. And then he moves on to his final and most important point, the grace of God. He is a savior. The Athenian people need to understand their need for a savior and how this uncommon God, through his grace, has provided one in the person of Jesus Christ. Paul tells them flatly that God has overlooked sin and ignorance for centuries, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. God held back his wrath, not because men weren't guilty, but because he had a plan. And in his timing, he sent his son. The Savior was killed and raised from the dead, and now God commands us to daily repent 
of the foolishness of our ways. Because one day, Jesus will return to judge the world. Jesus' resurrection from the dead proves that none of us will be exempt from his authority. So just like the Bible itself, Paul began with God as creator of all, and he ended his argument with God as judge of all. He worked his way through creation and sovereignty to end up at resurrection and repentance, right at the foot of the cross. The response to what Paul had spoke at the Areopagus, it it wasn't overwhelmingly positive. Some people believed, um, some people said they wanted to hear a little bit more later, and some rejected it completely. And you know what, Paul was fine with all of those responses because he knew that bringing people to salvation wasn't his ultimate responsibility. That was for God. But Paul had done his part. By speaking up, seeds were planted. And I think it's safe to say that after the fact, Paul's ad, um, address that is preserved for us in Scripture has bore more fruit than we could even imagine. Paul did not remain silent when confronted with a culture that was lost. Instead, he struck a perfect balance. He didn't just come out guns burning and condemning them for their sin and for their ignorance. He spoke the truth in love. He found common ground with them and then he introduced them to the uncommon God. Like Paul, we must be bold and seek to find common ground with unbelievers so that we can point them to uncommon faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, I do pray that we would all see the example of Paul's witness and that you would embolden us to find the words and the ways to find common ground with those we know in our life who may be searching, Lord, or completely lost. Lord, I ask these things in your precious name. Amen.